this morning and to open up to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 is where we're going to be at for most of our study today. And what we've seen so far is that God created everything good. He created in Genesis 1 and 2 everything good. And then last week we talked about the fall, that God created it good, but because of the fall, it all fell apart. And the rest of the story is God trying to piece it back together again. God redeeming his creation, and he's calling us to actually trust him. He's calling us to be part of that story where we trust God with our lives because we chased after creation instead of the creator. And now God's asking us, are you going to chase after the creator? Are you going to trust the creator? I think of this as like when I was trying to teach my kids to first swim. They're two years old. They're running around the pool. And what do you do as a parent from the inside of the pool? You lift up your hands and you say, what? Jump. Jump. I'll catch you. Jump. I have you. And I remember my kids would still go right to the edge and they'd look at me and they'd be, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking that jump. No, no way. And then once in a while, you get this daredevil that would just shoot from the pool, even when you weren't there, you know, they would just shoot out. And God's asking, are you willing to jump? Are you willing to trust God and jump into his arms? Do you believe he will catch you every single time? That's where we're at in Genesis 15 is God's piecing the story back together. Let's, uh, let's open up and we'll read together Genesis 15 and Right there in the first verse, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, already he starts out and says, after this. That's the key words, after this. After what? Well, you see, we we started talking about this origins in the trilogy series, three-part series Its origins is the first part because it's the beginning. It's the original. You have to go back from to the beginning from before. You have to go to the origin of the story. And so when he's talking about after this, you have to ask the question when you're doing Bible study, after what? What is the author talking about? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, we find out that God first appeared to Abram. There's a lot that's happened since the fall. You had Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had some children, Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter 4, and Cain actually kills Abel. Cain gets upset, he gets jealous of his brother, and he actually kills him. It's the first murder. It goes downhill really quick after the fall. And then God starts a new line through Seth, but people started to become so corrupt that God gets a little bit upset, and he decides to flood the earth, and he saves mankind through a person called Noah, who was actually a descendant of Seth's line, who God said, I'm going to work through Seth and his line because he followed the ways of God. So you have Noah and Noah's ark. And after Noah's ark, you get the Tower of Babel. So there's a lot that's taken place between the fall and God's covenant with Abram. But he comes to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. And here's what he tells him. He says, leave everything behind. Genesis chapter 12, it says this. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curse and you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So God comes to Abram and he says, Abram, I want you to leave everything behind. I want you to leave your people. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave everything behind in order to follow me. Where are we going, God? Abram, I'm not going to tell you. Well, how do we get there? 
Abram, you just have to follow me one step at a time. Well, God, give me some assurances. Give me some. God says, I will bless you. That's the assurance you get if you leave it all behind. It reminds me when we first become a Christian. Sometimes God's going to call us out of places. He's going to call us out of situations. He's going to tell us to leave the old life left behind. He's going to say, there's some relationships you need to leave behind. There's some people you need to leave behind. There's some things that you've been doing, some actions and addictions you need to leave behind because I'm calling you to something brand new. I'm calling you to something different. And covenant starts with promise. God gives Abram three promises. He says, guess what? I want you to leave your country, your family, and everything behind. But don't you worry. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless people through you. I'm going to make your name great, Abram. And you will be a blessing to all people. God says, I'm going to bless you. He gives them a promise of a blessing. And see, the basis of covenant is promise. That's what God gives Abram. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to promise that I'm going to bless you if you just take steps of faith to follow me. If you just leave your old ways behind. When God came to Abram, he was in the land of Ur. Ur was known for its pagan worship. It was known for worshiping God. They were very spiritual in Ur. But they worshiped all different types of God. They had a moon goddess that they believed in. And so when God came to Abram, he says, Abram, you've been living in this land of Ur. You've been worshiping this moon goddess. I'm a different type of God. And if you just follow me, I will bless you. And Abram had to go home and he had to tell his wife, sweetheart, I got a word from the Lord. He told us to leave it all, leave our house, to leave all our possessions, to leave your family, to leave it all in order to follow him. Now, I can just imagine that conversation and how it went. You see, he had to take a step of trust because of the promise. Covenant starts with promise. God came to him with a promise. Now, what is covenant, you might ask? What is covenant? The base of covenant is promise, but what is it? What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. A covenant is an agreement where both people are going to do something. It's an agreement between the two. And so what is covenant? A covenant is a chosen relationship or partnership in which two parties make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a type of goal. We see a different types of covenant within the Bible. One of the covenants we see is in a relationship between David and Jonathan. You see, King Saul wanted to kill David because people were chanting David's name. They were saying, Saul, he killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. And they were excited about David and Saul got a little jealous. He was king. Why are the people chanting on David? They should be chanting on me. So he planned on killing David because a evil spirit comes on him, a spirit of jealousy. Jonathan, Saul's son, loved David. They had a great friendship. They were best friends together. He didn't want to see his best friend get killed. So he creates a covenant with them in 1 Samuel 23. And it says, now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life. And while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horish and encouraged him. Thus he said, do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you. And you will be the king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows that also. So the two of them made a covenant. The two of them made a what? A covenant, an agreement. If you're following online, put covenant in the chat. They made a, a covenant, a promise to each other before the Lord. And David stayed at Horish while Jonathan went to his house. You also had political covenants. You see a covenant between Solomon, who was king, and also King Hiram. In 1 Kings 5, 10, and 12, they used each other to benefit one another. It says in this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with the cedar and juniper logs 
he wanted. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household in addition to 20,000 baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom just as he had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty, or you could say made a covenant, a promise to each other that they're going to continue to give each other olive oil, pressed cedar. They traded with one another. You see, there was an alliance between the two nations. There was an alliance between the kings. There was a covenant, a promise that they were making to each other. So God comes to Abram in Genesis 15. He tells him, after this, he says, so after the promise, after the covenant, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And this is what he says. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Well, why would Abram be afraid? So now we learn after this, what the origin of the story is that God gave him a promise. Abram took steps of faith, started to travel to the land God was showing him, relying on God to tell him the location. But something happened along the way where Abram needs some protection. He says, Abram, I'm going to be your shield. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Well, Abram had gotten himself into some trouble. So right before Genesis 15, we have Genesis 14, where Abram took along with his nephew Lot. And Lot's men and Abram's men began to increase in numbers, and they began to quarrel. You ever have family quarrels, family beef over things? You know, holidays are coming up, and you know when you get together with a lot of family, certain things come up like politics, and you don't want to mention politics because people start to fight right? Or you can mention something else and people start to argue. And, and so there was some arguments between Lot's men and Abram's men. Some, some beef started to happen, some arguments. And so Abram says, listen, I don't want any quarrels between your guys and my guys. I don't want any arguments here. So you go one direction, I'll go the other. If you choose this way, I'll choose that way. You get first pick. Abram was being so graceful and generous with him. Well, Lot picked himself a place where he got himself into some trouble, went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you've ever read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, there's some trouble there. Lot gets himself picked up, captured by other kings and carried off in their own fight with one another. Abram hears that his nephew Lot's in trouble, goes down there with some fighting men and ends up freeing his nephew Lot. So maybe Abram's scared that now there's going to be some retaliation against him. Maybe these other nations are going to come against him with war because he had freed his nephew Lot. And so God comes to him and gives him a promise. He says, don't be afraid, Abram. Don't be scared. I am your shield. I am your protection. I am your protector. You see, the result of covenant is protection. God says, I'm going to be your shield. You don't have to worry. I love how Jesus tells this to his disciples in John 14. Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, listen, I'm going to leave. His disciples start to get scared. They're a little bit anxious. What do you mean you're going to leave? We're supposed to be following you. He says, I'm going to go to a place where you can't follow, but I have to in order to send the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, do not worry. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Continues on. And he says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me and you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So Jesus again says, do not be scared. Do not be troubled. I love how he says, you don't have to fear because you know your protector. You know your protection. My father's room, my father's house has many rooms. I'm going to send a counselor to come back to you. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. You don't have to be worried. That's what God is trying to tell Abram here is, I am your shield. I am your protector. 
But then he continues on and says, not only am I your shield, he says, I'm your greatest reward. And so how else is he your shield? He says, you get me. The covenant is not just a covenant of protection. It's also a covenant of prompt presence. The beauty of covenant is he says, I am your reward. I am here with you. I am present with you. You get me as your shield, the God, the creator of the universe, but you also get me in relationship. You get me as your protector. And so God is present with Abram. The beauty of covenant is that God says, you get all of me, your very great reward. And so there's a difference between contract and covenant. There's a huge difference between contract and covenant. Genesis 15, 2a, God, Abram looks to God after God promises that he's going to be with him. He promises to be a shield. He promises through the covenant. And then look at what Abram's response is. But Abram said, verse 2, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? Notice the words here. What can you give me? What can I get out of this relationship? Isn't that how so many of us treat God? God, if I read my Bible, are you going to bless me the way I want you to bless me? God, if I pray, are you going to answer the prayers the way I want? You see, a lot of times if you look at your prayer requests, we can see that a lot of times it's about us. God, I, I want health. I want security. God, bless my children. God, bless my finances. God, I'm going through this struggle right now. If you notice how many times we say I in a prayer, we often look at it more like a contract. Like, God, if I put in so much in this relationship, I'm going to get more out of it, correct? Well, it's true. We get a lot more out of what we put in when it comes to a relationship with God. But a lot of us approach God in this idea of a contract. Like, God, if I do this, you're going to do this for me, right? If I do this, I'm going to get everything my heart desires. We look at contract like, God, this is an oath. This is, this is something signed, what I get out of it. Well, let me tell you something. If you go into a relationship looking what you get out of it, you're going to get in trouble. I mean, think about marriage. You stand and you create vows and you say your vows. But if you go into a marriage looking at what you're going to get out of the marriage... Isn't it true that sometimes we feel like we're putting a whole lot more in than what we're getting out? There's, there's certain situations in marriages where we feel like we're investing more in than what we're actually taking out. Or what about parenting? Parenting where you love your kids. Let me tell you, sometimes people have children because they want to get loved by the child. But I'm telling you as a parent, sometimes it's going to feel like you're putting a lot more in than what you're getting out especially when your kids are teenagers. I remember when they were little and they used to hug and kiss you. They used to get so excited when you'd walk through the door and now you walk through the door and it's like, hey, what's up? You know, and they're off. They don't care anymore. Like, I used to tell my daughter, give me a kiss on the cheek before she'd go in a place. And then she got to the point where she said, dad, I'm too old. Dad, I'm just, no, I'm not gonna do that. So I embarrassed her. She went into her dance studio and she thought, oh, I can beat him outside the car. So she jumped out of the car. I said, give me a kiss on the cheek. She jumps out of the car. She goes in the dance. I said, okay. I jump out of the car too. I run in the dance studio in front of all her friends. And I tackle her. I embarrassed her. Guess what? She gives me a kiss on the cheek now because she doesn't want to be embarrassed anymore. There's some times where it feels like we're putting a lot more in than what we're getting out. And God is not interested in contract. He's interested in covenant. A contract is a signed agreement. A contract says, then 
I put this in, you put this in. It's a mutual agreement between parties. But covenant is different. Contracts, there's an exchange of goods. Covenant, there's relationship. Contracts is about property. Covenants is about people. Contracts say, what can I get out of this if I invest this in? Covenants say, what can I put in instead? You see, covenants is all about relationship. What can you invest? What can you put in? What can you bring to the table? Not about what you get out. It's a shift in mentality that God is coming to Abram. And I'm going to show you that Abram gets all the blessings but the truth of the matter is, God's trying to establish relationship. He's trying to establish a covenant with Abram where he says, it's not about what you get out, Abram. It's about what you can invest in. God shows Abram that it's all about investing in. What can I get out of the relationship? I love what Tim Keller says. I have a quote here on my phone, and he says, sociologists argue that in contemporary Western society, the marketplace has become so dominant that the consumer model increasingly characterizes most relationships that historically were covenantal, including marriage. And this has crept its way into the church. Look what he says. He says, today we stay connected to people only as long as they are meeting our particular needs and an acceptable cost to us. When we cease to make a profit, that is, when the relationship appears to require more love and affirmation from us than we're getting back, then we cut our losses and drop the relationship. This has also been called commodification, a process by which social relationships are reduced to economic exchange relationships. And so the very idea of covenant is disappearing in our culture. Covenant is therefore a concept increasingly foreign to us, and yet the Bible says it is the essence of marriage. Praise God that we have a covenantal God that he doesn't say, what can I get back out of you? Praise God that he's willing to invest everything in Look, not looking at what he's getting back in return. Praise God that we have a God that we can worship that says, I'm all in regardless of your response. He doesn't cut us loose. He doesn't turn around. He doesn't let go when we're in a relationship with him. He doesn't say, you know what? They've rejected me. I'm going to reject them. No, we have a covenantal God who says, I'm all in regardless of their response. Amen. But Abram was still a little confused. He goes and says to God, Well, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? The one who will inherit my state is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children. You gave me this promise, Lord, but you haven't come through. You gave me this promise, but somebody else is going to inherit, inherit all of my estate. You have not come through with your promise. When are you going to deliver? I love what Julian of Norwich wrote in the 15th century. He said, God of your goodness, give me yourself. For you are sufficient for me. I cannot properly ask anything less to be worthy of you. If I were to ask less, I would always be in want. In you alone do I have it all. God, give me yourself. Abraham wasn't looking for God. He was looking for a child. Abraham wasn't looking for a relationship with a God. He was looking for a blessing from a God. Give me a child. That's what I want. How will I know you promised me? When you have not come through, Genesis 15, verse 2b and 3 says, Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar? Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born to my house will be my heir. And God takes Abraham outside and he says, look up at the stars. You see that I've created all this? I will give you an heir. 
I will give you a child. You will have a son. And it says, Abram believed in verse 6. And God credited it to him as righteousness. You see, Abram had, didn't have to do anything in order to earn salvation. What he had to do was belief. He had to trust. He had to be willing to say, I don't see it going on right now in my life. My circumstance says contrary to the word of God. The promise has not been delivered. But he says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to believe me? Are you going to trust in what you cannot see and believe in what is not in front of you? That is what we call faith. And because Abram had faith, God credited it to him as righteousness. I've always asked the question, how are people in the Old Testament saved? If Jesus hadn't showed up on the scene yet, how are they saved? It's through this verse. Abram believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. You guys all have credit cards. What do you do? You take a credit card, you put it in the machine, you get the product now and the payment comes later right? Because then you get a bill at your house and you have to pay it. That's what credit is. Credit is payment later. Product now, payment later. You see, when God credits Abraham, what he's saying is you get salvation now, the payment comes later. You get a relationship with God now, the payment comes later, all because of his belief and faith. The same way in the New Testament, we have to have belief and faith. We have to believe in what we cannot see. We have to have faith and trust in God. But Abraham believed in one moment, but then began to doubt again in the next. You see, Abraham has some doubts. He believes in its credit as righteousness. And that's why he's called the father of faith. But then he begins to ask, will God really keep his covenant? Will God really honor his word? Will he keep what he said he's going to do? Will he come through for me in my time of need? And look at what it says in Genesis 15, 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to the land that you will inherit. And here's Abram's response to him when he gives him the promise again. I brought you out of Ur. I brought you out of the land of Chaldeans. I'm going to bring you to the promised land. I'm reiterating the promise from Genesis 12, Abram, because you believed on this God. And then Abram's response to him is this. Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Well, because I just said so, Abram. I just told you. But Abram has some doubts. And the reason I love this so much is because sometimes in our Christian faith, we act like we can't have doubts. We act like we have to have it all together, that we can't ever struggle, that we can't ever question God. You see, God doesn't get upset at Abram for his doubts. In a sense, doubts, I'm not saying are good, but at the same time, God receives those doubts and he gives them answers. Look at Doubting Thomas. When Jesus comes to Thomas, he gets the name Doubting Thomas because why? The other disciples had already seen Jesus. Thomas wasn't there. So now they're in a room and the disciples are telling Thomas, we saw Jesus. Thomas is like, no, I saw him too. He was dead. No, we saw him alive. Thomas is like, no, I saw him on the cross. I watched him die. The disciples are like, yeah, we saw him rise from the dead. And Thomas like, quit trying to play a, an April Fool's practical joke on me. And he says, I'm not going to believe until I can actually place my hands, my finger in his hands where the scars are, and my hand on his side where he was pierced. I watched him die. A week later, Jesus shows up. Thomas falls to his knees, shocked. Jesus is alive. And Jesus comes to him. And what does he do? He says, Thomas, place your hands here on my scar. Place your hands on my side. Thomas says, I'm not worthy. Jesus didn't cast him out. Look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist sends word to Jesus and says, as he's sitting in jail and he's about to be beheaded, he asks his disciples to go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one? Jesus looks at the disciples of John the Baptist and he says, you've seen 
You've seen people healed. You've seen the blind who can see. You can see the ones who are deaf are here. They can hear now. You've seen people healed. Now you're asking if I'm the one. You go back and you tell John who I am. They go back. Did Jesus kick John out of the kingdom? No, he didn't. You see, so often we act like we have to have it all together. We act like we can't question. We act like we can't struggle. Like, I got to be this strong Christian all the time. I'm telling you, God receives even our doubts. He sees even our struggles. And here in Abram, he says, Abram, look what I'm going to do. Abram says, how am I going to know? And God says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to enter into a one-sided covenant with you. One-sided you see, a covenant where was two people would come together and they would ba- both make oaths. They would come together and they would both make promises. And this is the God we have. He says, Abram, go get for me two animals that I can cut. Abram runs off and gets two animals. And this word covenant in the Hebrew is bear it. And what it means is to cut, to slice in half. Because the idea here is when you are entering into a covenant, you would take an animal, you would slice it in half, And you would put one half of the animal on one side and another half of the animal on the other side. And the blood would drip down into a little bit of a valley. And then you would remove your shoes or your sandals and both parties would walk through the blood. And when they got to the end, they would shake because now their feet are covered with blood. And what they're saying is that we agree That if something, if I break this covenant, if I break this oath, if I break this promise, may my life be taken, may my blood be shed the same as the animal we just walked through. What he's saying is, if I lie to you and I break this oath, you can go ahead and kill me. And so Abram, he immediately runs off and he's like, oh yeah, I understand this, this is a covenant. This means to cut. So he cuts the animals, he divides it, and he's expecting, what he's pretty much saying is, God, how do I know you're going to give me this land? How do I know you're going to come through? God, sign on the dotted line. This is where we get some attorneys. We lawyer up at this point, and we get out the pen, and we say, okay, sign on the dotted line. Sign the contract. God, if you're making this promise, I want for sure that this is going to happen. I'm taking you to court, God. You're going to answer me right now. And so Abram's ready. But God doesn't show up. How do we know that God doesn't show up? Because it had taken quite a bit of time between the time that God or Abram had cut the pieces and then the carcasses are just sitting. Abram's sitting there ready to walk through, and God waits. How do we know? We'll go down to 1511 and 159. It says, so he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all three, in verse 10, to him, and out of the two, down the middle, and placed a piece opposite of each other. He cut them and placed them on both sides. The blood is running down, but he did not cut the birds in two. And then 11, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. You see, there had been so much time that had been sitting there that vultures had come down. Normally, vultures don't eat live meat that's just... they. they been killed right away. Normally it takes about 24 hours of decay before a vulture will actually come down and try to eat the meat. Vultures like dead prey. They feed on dead carcasses. And so we know that there's quite a bit of time that passed, at least 24 hours, where Abram cut these carcasses in two and he's just waiting. And the birds came down in order to steal the sacrifice makes me begin to think how Jesus talked about a parable. A parable of some seed that's scattered on the path. The seed is the word of God. And one of the things that happen with the seed is that the birds come down and they gobble up the seed. The birds come down and they eat the seed. Satan tries to steal the seed away, the seed that's planted. Abraham is standing with the carcasses and he's busy off driving out birds. He's busy driving the birds away until he wears himself out. He gets so tired that he gets placed into a deep sleep. He, gets, he just wears himself out trying to drive out the birds. And what we see here is that when he finally falls asleep, 
says, now that the sun was going down in verse 12, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. See, there's a difference between the deep sleep that Adam felt and the deep sleep of Abram. When Adam fell asleep, God put him into a deep sleep, took a rib from him, performed surgery and crafted Eve out of a rib from his very own side. When Abram fell asleep, it says a darkness came over him. A darkness, sin, misery, brokenness, the way that the world is today. I think about Jesus when he's hanging on the cross in Matthew 27. And it says the world became dark. You see, all the sin of the entire world were about to be placed on the cross and the entire world became dark for over three hours. Darkness as Abram is sitting there asleep. And then God shows up. God shows up in verse 17. It says, when the sun had set, the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. Now, what's interesting here is that a nice king would have gone through the pieces with the servant. He would have said, hey, listen, servant, let's go through this together. That would have been a very generous king who goes above and beyond. Other kings would have just sent their servant through the pieces saying, you make the covenants, you serve me. This is what I want you to see. This is a one-sided covenant. We have a God who says, Abram, well, you're fast asleep. Well, you're off in the corner. Well, you're dwelling about the darkness. God shows up and he passes through the pieces all by himself. In a sense, what he's saying is, Abram, if I break this covenant, I will die. And if you break this covenant, I will die. The weight and the responsibility of this covenant is upon me. Abram, you're fast asleep in the corner God is the one creating the promises, fulfilling the promises, keeping the promises. We have a God who keeps his promise, who honors his word, and he says, even when you break this covenant, I will die, foreshadowing Jesus, because we all know that we fell asleep, that we disobeyed God, that there's a darkness that we're dwelling in in our dreams. There's a horror nightmare that we're living, and that is sin, for the wages of sin is death darkness but a light came into the world a light that shined bright and he says for the wages of sin is death in romans 6 23 but the gift is christ jesus see it's a gift the gift is eternal life through christ jesus our lord and savior says even when you break your promises even when you go astray i still will pass through this covenant. I still will pass through these dead pieces. I will give my life for you. My blood will be spilled for you. See, so often we think that we have to do something in order to earn God's grace. So often we think we have to get our life together before God truly loves us and accepts us. So often we think that we need to pray more or read our Bible more in order to get God's blessing. I want you to understand from this covenant that you had to do absolutely nothing, that it was all about God and what he was going to do and what he did. This is a one-sided covenant and ultimately that God's love is unconditional. You see, his blessings are conditional, but his love is unconditional. Abram had to believe, trust, and start to take a step forward in order to see God's blessings. He had to spend time with God and move forward in order to receive his blessings, but automatically he receives his love. God's blessings might be conditional, but his love is unconditional. We feel like we made mistakes and we messed up, that we've gone astray and we've ruined things. But God is saying, I love you regardless. I love you before you made that decision to worship me. I love you before you made that decision to come to church. I loved you before you made that decision to go astray. God loves us when we go astray and even when we come back. He's calling us back 
through his love for us. It's one-sided covenant that God is saying, I will die for you to show you how much I love you and how much I care for you. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is have faith. There's someone who maybe stumbled in church today who's been feeling like, I'm unworthy. The truth is we're all unworthy. Feels like you need to get things back together. Well, we all have things that unravel all the time. And the truth of the matter is God is the hero of the story. God is the one piecing things back together. God is the one who enters into a relationship with us. While we were still yet sinners, Christ Jesus chose to die for us, to show us his love. God loves us regardless I know most marriages don't operate like that. I know most relationships don't operate like that. And thank God we have a God who's covenantal, who does not let us down, who does not say, you know what? You're not investing anything in. I'm not going to invest anything in. No, he's a God who gave everything for us. And he just just deserves our worship and our praise. And so I'm going to ask for you to bow your heads because there's somebody in here or even somebody online who's saying, What, God, are you going to give me? And that's the wrong question. God already gave you everything. He already gave you unconditional love. He already gave you his son, Jesus. It's already one-sided. As we've gone astray, he's chosen to die for us on the cross. Spill his blood as the person of Jesus died so we could have life. And all you do is have to receive it. All you do is have to believe it. The same faith that Abram had, you just have to have. Maybe you're praying that a circumstance changes. God says, I'm not interested in changing your circumstance. I'm interested in giving you my presence. Maybe you're saying, my life is spinning uncontroll, uncontrollably right now. What God says is, I am your shield. I am your reward. I am the controller. I am the protector. I am the creator. All you do is have to desire me and everything else will fall into place. Romans 10, 8, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All you do is need to confess and believe. That's it. We confess what we believe, that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead and you shall have eternal life. You shall have a relationship. You should have covenant with the father i'm going to say a prayer and if you want to receive that today all you do is have to repeat these words father god i know that i'm a sinner i know that i deserve death but you gave me your son jesus he died on the cross he was raised from the dead i believe and now i receive the life that you want to give me In Jesus' name, help me to follow you always. Amen. If you've ever said that prayer, if you've ever confessed Jesus, the Bible tells us that there is a party in heaven. We want to know about it. We want to walk beside you. But let's stand to our feet and let's honor and worship the covenantal God, the one who creates covenant with us despite who we are, what we've done, despite our past. And he says, I want to enter into a relationship brand new with you.